This is Thanksgiving week, and I, I usually try to have some message on being thankful because we've got to remind ourselves that we're supposed to be a thankful people. And uh, what better time to remind ourselves, look, we, we have to live grateful. That's, that's the way we should live as Christians. You know, I've, I've made some observations through the years uh, as a pastor. I have observed that people who are truly thankful are joyful. The thankful are joyful. And I've also observed the opposite. Those who are ungrateful are not joyful. They tend to be miserable. And we're supposed to, as Christians, you know, we're supposed to live in, in, in uh, with a thankful heart, uh, a a heart that praises the Lord and, and, is, and is ever thankful for all the Lord has done for us. Uh, a quick trip overseas to almost any third world country will, will change the way you think uh, about a lot of things. Uh, make your way with me this morning to Second Timothy chapter 3, if you would make your way with me over there, Second Timothy chapter 3, that'll be our, that'll be our text. Huh. I'm going to pull the plug on. I was going to play a song today, but but then I would be forced to sing, and, 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 and you know, I just, I can't do that, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk today about the ungodly ungrateful. The ungodly ungrateful. And what Glenn was referring to is that I had Anthony cue up a song from the Wayback Machine, because in preparing this message today, I kept hearing that song. I was going to play it. It's an old Al Wilson song. But I decided not to because once, if I play it, you're going to be singing it all week. But it's an old Al Wilson song. You know, Al Wilson was a, a Mississippi guy. He, he was from Meridian, Mississippi, who hit it big in the R&B back in the 60s. Uh, he sang a song called The Snake. <laughs> you knew it was going to be The Snake, huh? Boy, what a catchy tune about a lady on her way to work one morning, walking a path along the lake, and, and she found a poor half-frozen snake. And so she said, I'm going to take you in and I'm going to take care of you. So she picked that snake up and she carried it home and she wrapped it up in cloth and she laid it by her fireplace so it would warm up and she went off to work. When she came back from work, the snake had been revived. I mean, you have to hear Al Wilson sing this song. It's, of course, we're not going to play it. I'll just sing it. Yeah, I'll just sing it for everybody. But, but Al Wilson, could, uh, he could sing it, you know, like, Take me in, old tender woman. Take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, old tender woman. Cried the snake. Boy, he could sing it, you know. It just, you heard the snake. <laughs> she came home. She found that snake revived. She said, oh, you're so beautiful. She picked it up. She coddled it. She hugged it. She kissed it. And then the words say, but instead of being thankful, the snake gave her a vicious bite. Well, you know, it was a snake. Yeah. And so she said, you are poisonous snake. Now you know I'm going to die. All of this is in the song. Y'all remember Al Wilson? 
Never heard the song, the snake. Yeah. Well, the snake says, shut up, silly woman. Shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew darn well I was a snake before you took me in. I thought, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about ingratitude, okay? I don't think a snake can be grateful. No, I don't think so either. I don't think it's in their nature. Now, not all snakes are bad. I have an advocate for snakes in the back row. <laughs> Yeah, Brother Rob, you know, Brother Rob had a 20-foot python, 20 foot long. Two years ago, just to give you an idea how powerful a 20-foot python may be, two years ago, this lady in Indiana, she had an 8-foot python. She wasn't coming to her door. So people... I guess they called the authorities. The authorities went to her house. This was just two years ago this month. They had to get into her house, and they found her with this eight-foot python around her neck, and she was dead. I mean, it, it crushed her windpipe and asphyxiated her to death. Of course, what they didn't expect was they found 140 other snakes in her house as well. But she might have had a problem, maybe. But... But, you know, you can raise a snake from infancy. You can rescue it. You can warm it by the fire. You can pet it, hug it, love it. It don't love you back. It has no feelings of gratitude or thankfulness whatsoever. I read something. I read something in the... Uh, on the internet, in, it was a newspaper, but I was reading in the internet just last year about this guy in South Africa who rescued a baby hippopotamus. They called them pups, I think. But he rescued this hippopotamus, and, uh, and he did what that woman did. He brought it home. He nurtured it. He raised it. He would ride it around. He, there, there were pictures of him riding the hippo like people ride, an, uh, you know, Ride a dog, uh, not a dog. Well, maybe my dog, but they would they would ride a ride a horse. Yeah. So pictures of him riding a hippopotamus. He he treated this hippopotamus. He actually was interviewed on all kinds of news channels. He said this this hippopotamus is like my son. He's a son to me. He's perfectly harmless. He would never harm anybody. And then he got to weigh a couple of tons. And he bit him, bit the guy and killed him. You know, hippopotamuses are considered the most dangerous animal in Africa. And one of the most dangerous animals in all the world. They kill more people than lions. They kill more people than tigers. They say, they say hippopotamus kills about 500 people a year. They are, they are considered the most dangerous animal in all of Africa, hippopotamus. You can love it. And it's not, a, it's not a reptile. I mean, it's a mammal. You can love it. They kill more people than sharks. <laughs> and they're not even carnivorous. They're herbivorous. They don't eat people, but they kill people. They, they're also known for their... Uh, the, the, their wild, you know, swings and moods. They're so unpredictable. Ingratitude. That's, that's my point. I'm, I'm, some way I'm talking about ingratitude in here today. The Bible tells us, you're in 2 Timothy chapter 3? Okay, good. So, 2 Timothy 3, I want to read a passage beginning in verse 13 where the Bible says, Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. They will grow worse 
and worse as we grow as we move more and more into the end times evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived evil men now this is an interesting thing about the word evil here because it actually speaks of them being evil in their nature not just that they do evil things but they are evil like strong strong's definition brings that out strong defines it this way it means their essential character their essential character is evil evil in nature it's what they are and that particular greek word comes from another word that means to be rotten to be rotten to be corrupt to be worthless and it further defines it evil as degenerate vicious bad lewd malicious and and of course other things but evil men evil in their very being in their very nature that's what it's not just what they do it's who they are it's their character evil men and the word for men anthropos so it's generic it means men women as well it covers all human beings will wax worse and worse well men they will and evil men and seducers and seducers actually that's a very good word uh, a very good definition a very good translation because it means that deceivers impostors can also mean enchanters wizards uh, diviners but but here's what will happen in the last days men evil in nature corrupt vile rotten rotten in in their very core will wax worse and worse they'll become more evil you know as bad as people can be as bad as they are they could be worse as as evil as they are they could be worse and in the bible the bible says in the last days they will become worse because they're going to keep getting worse human nature is not improving it is deteriorating men are becoming more vicious more cruel more vile more lewd more ungodly we're moving further away from godliness and plunging headlong into godlessness that's the direction that the whole world is in right now unfortunately so they will wax worse and worse the bible says becoming more numerous and they will increase in their ungodliness Amen. the world is not becoming kinder no it's not becoming more gentle it's not becoming more patient it's becoming more cruel more violent more impatient more angry yes. more vicious Amen. more hateful more divided more unforgiving and more unthankful you're right as our nation and most of the nations of the world have rejected god as they have rejected the bible standards of morality behavior uh, 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 or any standard on how we should live how we should be able to live together we find men becoming more like animals amen it's interesting people want to ascribe human characteristics to animals you know like i'm going to love this snake so it's going to love me back it's going to appreciate all the love uh they don't do that no they're incapable of doing that right. because they are snakes they have a snake nature Amen. i love this big giant hippopotamus and i know he loves me too i can see it in his big giant eyes just realize that they're not 
They're not people. They're animals. They have an animal nature. And you know, the same thing is true with unbelievers. Unbelievers do not have a godly nature. In fact, you're right here in 2 Timothy 3. Back up with me just to verse 1. Because the context of verse 13, the verse we just read, the context is verse 1. This know also. Know this. This is something important for us to know. That in the last days, perilous times, perilous, difficult, dangerous times. In fact, grievous times is how the Greek defines it. Grievous. The last days will be grievous. They might come. No, they shall come. They shall come far. Men shall be. And, and here he begins a list of 19 characteristics of the godless. This is quite a list here. 19 characteristics of the godless in the last days. We don't want any of these characteristics to describe us. The opposite of these characteristics should describe us. But I'm going to read them very quickly. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, and from such turn away. Nineteen characteristics. I could go through this whole list, but I'm not going to. But what I want us to recognize today is this list also describes what the godless are, not just what they do. We're not talking just about deeds. You know, anybody's capable of doing a deed they shouldn't do. But when it comes to the godless, the unbelieving, this is who they are by their very nature. Amen. Notice the very first thing on this list. This is going to be in verse 2 right here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Wow. True. Lovers of their own selves. That uh, We would call that probably today narcissistic people who are just totally wrapped up in themselves. Amen. Coming from narcissists, uh, the ancient demigod who fell in love with his own image or reflection on the side and looking in a pond he saw himself <laughs> reflected and he fell in love with the image it was so beautiful so according to the legend he died there beside the pond because he couldn't eat he was love struck <laughs> he couldn't eat he couldn't drink he was so in love with the image in the water that he, that he died beside the pool, I guess from starvation and being love heartbroken. And, and to this day there are flowers that they call narcissist, the, the, the narcissist flowers because it's supposed to be the, po the flowers that were growing alongside the pond where Narcissus, the, the uh, demigod, died. Yeah. They actually today believe that there is an increase in narcissistic behavior that it there's always been narcissists, but today today the experts are concerned that we're raising a whole new generation of narcissists who are completely self absorbed. They think only of themselves. In fact, narcissists didn't have a camera. You know, he didn't have an iPhone, but if he did, guess what he'd be taking pictures of? We, we have health experts, mental health experts who are wondering if we're not producing 
narcissist. And narcissistic behavior with all of our selfies. Pictures of me in 4,000 poses. That's just today. That's just today. They actually have a disorder. They call it, they call it narcissistic personality disorder. That they have this, they, 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 hey, here's the things that characterize a narcissist, they say. Maybe you are one. Check yourself out. They have this inflated sense of self importance. They have a preoccupation with fantasies of just unlimited success and wealth and power and beauty and they have a belief that they are special and that they are unique and they can really only be understood by or, or really they should only associate with other people of really high status uh, people or people you know, very accomplished people because they feel like basically they're better than everybody else. You know, they, uh, they need admiration. They need people's applause. They have a sense of entitlement. They exploit others. They will use other people for their own benefit, you know, for their benefit. Uh, they don't care about other people. They, they are unable to empathize 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 with others and they always believe people are envious of them and of course haughty arrogant proud there is something that goes along with pride it walks hand in hand with pride and you know what that is ingratitude ingratitude and pride hold hands. Amen. They always do. Lovers of their own selves. And, you know, of course, if they love their own selves, then covetous, the second thing on the list, they love money. They love things. They love possessions because they deserve them, they think. I'm entitled to them. Right. These things are for me, and you shouldn't have them. They're not for lesser people. Nice things are not for lesser people. Nice things are for me. <laughs> Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. You know what disobedient to parents amounts to? Right, right. Defiance. Yeah. Yeah. It's defiance. It's rebellion. It's people who don't want rules. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. Rules don't apply to me. Disobedience to, to parents. And notice what's on this list of ungodly, ungodliness. Unthankful, verse 2. They are unthankful, unappreciative, ungrateful, the opposite of being thankful, unholy. Like I said, I could go down the whole list, but here's something that came to my thoughts just this week as I was going down some of this list. You know, when you start with the first one, men will be lovers of their own selves, men or women. You know that those who are narcissists, lovers of self, all the rest of the things that are mentioned here in verse 2 are manifestations of that narcissism. All of those things apply to them as well. They have all the rest of these characteristics. In fact, I think you could go down this list of all 19 of these qualities and probably find that that they all would be a characteristic of those who are in love with themselves those who believe that the whole world revolves around them and you know those who really believe that they're so in love with themselves like narcissus looking at his reflection in in the pond those who are in love with themselves really don't have room to love anybody else. That's true, right? Not real love. No. They have affection. They'll have affection for others as long as they're getting something out of them. Right. Because they're users. They're users of people. That's 
As long as, I, as long as you benefit me, then I can tolerate you, even though you are a lesser person. You'll never attain to my uniqueness, as the narcissist would think. But there's no room for the love, real love of others, and certainly no real room for the love of God. And while I could go down this whole list, I'm not going to do that this morning because I really want to focus on one thing, this being Thanksgiving week, and, and that being how ingratitude is the opposite of what a Christian should be, as you and I have a different nature from the rest of the world. We are, according to 2 Corinthians 5:17. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have been born again. And you know when you are born again, when you are changed, you are completely transformed. You get a new nature. You don't have the old snake nature. You know, even snakes are going to get a new nature in the millennial kingdom. You get to passages like Isaiah chapter 11, and it talks about wolves playing with lambs and lions and lambs and children playing with venomous, you know, serpents. Everything gets a new nature in the millennial kingdom of God. Everything gets a new nature so that nothing is poisonous, nothing kills, nothing destroys. In fact, Isaiah 11 says there will be nothing that destroys in all my holy mountain and all of in all of the millennial kingdom. But you, you as a Christian, you don't have to wait till the millennium to get a new nature. You might have to wait till then to get a new body. Or wait till we die or we, you know, we fly one or the other. But uh, as far as a new nature, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things are become new so that you find yourself as a Christian actually empathizing with others, that you care about others, and you genuinely pray for others. You have concerns for them. You love. You love. And you give of yourself unselfishly without thinking of what you're going to get back in return. And you can give freely and joyfully and thankfully that you can give, that you can help. And, and being Thanksgiving week, certainly one of the things that should characterize the believer is a thankful heart. That we are truly, genuinely thankful. And you and me, boy, we have so much to be thankful for. I don't think we could ever run out of things to thank God for. He has blessed us more than we deserve. I like it. I'll, I'll ask people sometimes, how you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? I like it when they say, I'm doing better than I deserve. Amen. You're right. It's not right when you say, well, I deserve a lot better than this. <laughs> And then you get to the, the atheist, you know, Thanksgiving week. They don't believe in a creator. So you're not, you're not going to give thanks to God. They don't believe in a, 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 a divine benefactor of any kind. So I guess, I guess they give thanks to random chance. Or, you know, because... Really, atheists, skeptics, unbelievers, they believe they are what they are, they have what they have because of some random chance of the universe and their own self-will and self-effort. So I give thanks to myself, like one atheist said. I give thanks to myself. He, he is his own God. It's a pathetic God, but... And I know that sometimes just in the course of an everyday conversation, you'll hear somebody say, well, thank God. And we are supposed to thank God. But I think it comes out of our lips sometimes almost trite or comes out of 
some lips sometimes almost trite. But you and I, when we say thank God, we need to know we really do thank God. We need to think about that. We really do. We have him to thank. Because everything we do, everything we have, everything we know, everything we are is due to our divine benefactor. Because he loved us. Loved us enough to go to the cross for us. Die in our behalf. Bestow upon us whatever ability, capability, knowledge, wisdom. Whatever we have, it's because God granted it to us. None of it is due to ourselves. Nobody can pat themselves on the back. We weren't made like that so that we can pat our own backs up. Doesn't well, our arms don't even go back there. That means you're not supposed to do that. We are, on the other hand, supposed to thank God. You're right. And that, that is not an, an empty or trite phrase, thank God. And again, I want to mention that the Bible says the unrighteous are ungrateful. The unrighteous, it's just inherent in their nature. The unrighteous are inherently ungrateful. The Bible even declares it. There's a passage over in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read it to you. You can turn there if you like, or you can just listen. But I'm going to read Romans 1, verses 19 through 22, where the Bible says, Because that which may be no, made known of God is made manifest to, in them, that is, to, to really to all the world. For God has showed it unto them, verse 20, For the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is really an interesting verse, Romans 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him, the invisible things of God, he says, from the creation of the world, or regarding the creation of the world, are clearly seen. Wait. We clearly see what is invisible. How do we clearly see what is invisible? The Bible says here that it's understood by the things that are made. We can see the God who is invisible by seeing the creation of God. Everything that he created, we see his fingerprint. We see his divine authorship. We see God through what he made. That is, it's a reflection of his eternal power and Godhead, his eternal power and glory. Who could make this? Who could design this? Who could create this? And then Romans 1 goes on and says, verse 20, so that they were, or are, they are, without excuse. Without excuse. No one can say, there's no God. I don't see any evidence of him. You don't see any evidence of him. You mean you don't want to see. You don't want to see. That's the bottom line. You don't want to see. Look at your, your body, even if your body ain't exactly a picture of great health. And yet, it is the most complex machine ever designed. Ever, ever designed. And to think that that would come up come about by some random chance of evolution is an absurdity too foolish to even begin to contemplate. Who could believe that something is complex, every single part of our body so incredibly complex that people dedicate their entire lives to studying one small, tiny aspect and still can't grasp it? Mankind can't produce anything like a human being. The best that we can do, does, it, it falls so short. This, this body that attains knowledge, stores it, employs it, sends these signals throughout all of your body to grab this, point your finger, scratch your leg, the capability of speech, of thought, of invention, of dreaming, of aspirations, you are unique. Amen. 
Romans 1.21 says, Because when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. And then this condemning statement, Neither were thankful. Neither were they thankful. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. God's thoughts, you don't want to see God's thoughts turning out the lights. And then Romans 1.22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They, they were, neither were they thankful. They were unthankful towards people, but actually the context here means they were unthankful towards God. So, verse 20 calls that their unbelief inexcusable, and verse 22 of Romans 1 declares them to be fools. Let's add that up. Neither were they thankful. You add that up. They, they're unthankful, unbelieving, fools. That's what the Bible calls them. So add it up, two plus two. The bottom line is this, fools are ungrateful. The Bible tells us that these godless lovers of themselves are an unthankful bunch. All you have to do is read the Bible and you will see so many examples of ingratitude Maybe we see it in places that you never thought to even look for it before, but so many places in the Bible speaks of man's ingratitude. You read all the way back in the book of Genesis, and you see the chief butler that was imprisoned with Joseph. Remember? The butler and the baker. The chief butler, he was the the cupbearer for the king. They dreamed a dream. Joseph interpreted the dream, says, you're going to be out of here. You're going to be out of here in just a few days. And when you get out, you're going to go back to your job serving the king. Remember me. And the Bible says, Genesis 40, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph. Not a whole lot of gratitude. As soon as uh, you help me and... uh, I'm out of your presence, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Right. Forget all about Joseph until some terrible thing happened two years later. But right. I, 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 got, I got to thinking about Absalom, you know, wow. King David's own son. Yeah. Golly, what a, what a picture of ingratitude. His own son and a son that he loved. Right. A son that David loved. Yep. In fact, This son plotted the overthrow of David's kingdom. This son plotted his own father's death. And this young man had everything. He he was the best looking man in the kingdom. You know how the Bible describes his hair and his good looks and so forth? He had such charisma, such charm, his winsomeness, even though it was deceptive. He was a deceiver. It, it won over the nation. All of this just so he could usurp his father's throne. And you know, he probably would have inherited the throne had he just bid his time and, and been a good son. But pride and anger and a desire for vengeance. You know, his sister got raped. And he, he wanted to kill the guy who did it. He plotted for years, and he finally did it. Killed, yeah. killed his own half-brother. But all of that anger seething in his heart, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, it turned this handsome young man who had the whole world, the whole world at his disposal, it turned him into something vile, violent, vicious, cruel, evil. Before it was all over, he plotted his own father's death and was killed when he incited a rebellion against his own father. What a picture of ingratitude. There's another interesting picture in the Bible. There's many different examples, but 
There's an interesting little passage over in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to have you turn there with me if you don't mind. Uh, where a whole city turns ungrateful. Y'all awake? Yeah. Hang with me a little bit. Yeah. Look with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Right after Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Then there's the little book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read beginning in chapter 9. Just an interesting little passage, just a few verses of Scripture. Ecclesiastes 9, I'm going to read beginning in verse 14. Ecclesiastes 9, 14. There was a little city. Not a big one, just a little city, and few men within it. So not a huge population, not, not a lot of soldiers or anything defending it. A small city, few men, and there came a great king against it and laid siege to it and built great bulwarks against it. Now the little city is in a whole lot of trouble. Because a great king, powerful king, big army, came against it, laid siege to it. An army that lays siege, they surround the city. Nobody can come in. Nobody can go out. They'll starve you out. Then when they build their bulwarks, that is, they're going to come across your walls. They are going to knock your walls down. They're going to slaughter everybody in it. Verse 15 says, now there was found in it, that is in this little city, a poor wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. He, by his wisdom, somehow delivered this whole city from the clutches of this king who had besieged it. And yet, no man remembered that same poor man. Where's the gratitude? Then said I, verse 16, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. I mean, he was so quickly forgotten, the poor man. Why? Why was he so quickly forgotten? Well, basically because people admire the rich and famous. They heap their accolades upon the rich and famous. And the poor tend to be obscure in their minds and hearts. But what a picture here of ingratitude, ingratitude. The whole little town was ungrateful. There's another passage in the book of 1 Samuel. I'd like for you to turn there with me if you would. Can you hang with me a little bit? 1 Samuel. Make your way over there if you would. 1 Samuel. We're going to read chapter 23, a few verses here. This in this account, King David is being hunted. Well, he's not king. David is not king. He was anointed king by Saul, but uh, by Samuel. But Saul is still the king. And Saul is driven by demons at this point in his life. Saul is so jealous of David, so insecure, that, that Saul has taken to chasing him down. David has had to go hide. He's hiding in mountains and, and fields and woods and caves. And, and David is running from Saul and his army. Saul is so bent on destroying David that anybody who helped David, Saul kills him. I mean, it even got to the point where Saul is killing the priests of God who helped, who helped David. And they were helping David because they, they thought, hey, he's a national hero. We didn't know 
Saul's out to kill him. They helped him not knowing. And Saul killed him anyway. He killed 85 priests at Nob. So Saul is, is uh, being driven by demons. And David and his men are having to run continually to stay out of Saul's clutches. But even while David is running from King Saul, he, he cares about what's going on in the land of Israel. And when you get to chapter 23 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, chapter 23, verse 1, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Keilah is just a little small city of Jews that's being plundered by the Philistines. Therefore, verse 2, David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. So David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? It's bad enough here. We're running from Saul. Now we're going to go make war against the Philistines. We have them against us and Saul against us. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah, and they fought with the Philistines, and brought away their cattle, and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Him and his men, they killed these Philistines, and they saved the inhabitants of the whole city. Verse 6, it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David, to Keilah, he came down with an ephod in his hand. And when it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, Saul said, God has delivered him into mine hand. He shut in by entering into a town that has gates and bars and Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men. Saul says, we got him now. We're going to go surround the city. We're going to destroy David. And verse 9, David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. He said to Abiathar the priest, bring, me the, bring here the ephod, ephod. This is how they would communicate with God, get answers from God through the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Now God's, David's inquiring of God. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, Tell thy servant, and the Lord said, he will come down. Will David come here? Will will Saul come here, David said? He will come. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Will Saul come? He will come. Will they turn me over to Saul? They will turn you over to Saul. He just saved the whole city. But you know, people tend to look out for their own skins. That's just the unregenerate nature of mankind. They're going to look out for their own selves. Thank you for what you did. Really, I really appreciate it. Now, Saul, here he is. You take him. So David and his men, which verse 13 says were about 600, they rose and they left. And when it was told Saul that David was escaped, you know, he didn't have to go to Keilah now because David's gone. But isn't that something? You know, you got another little picture here that it would be off really my topic, but you get a little picture here of that fate is not as fixed as some people think. 
that they, they think, you know, I'm just a prisoner of fate. Things are going to happen to me the way God dictates it to be, and that's all there is. But David had a choice. He could stay in Keilah. Right. If he stayed in Keilah, God told him this is what's going to happen. Right. You will be betrayed. Saul will come. You will be betrayed. They will turn you over to Saul. He could have stayed. Or he had something that some people say we don't have. Freedom to make our own choices and decisions. Or you could go. And if you go, Saul's still going to come after you, but you're not going to be betrayed by the men of Keilah. So they will deliver you up. They will not protect you. They will not defend you. I would say that's an example of ingratitude. They, I guess they assume they owed, owed David nothing. There's so many other examples I could cite. Really, just I could cite the example of Israel in the wilderness right. and all their murmuring and complaining and God telling his people, don't be like that. In fact, God says, look, don't be like Israel with all their murmuring in the wilderness and so on. They're complaining and so forth. Beloved, we can do better than that as Christians. Yes. Amen. We can do better. We are blessed. We should be a thankful people. Amen. Brother David spoke a couple Wednesday nights ago. Uh, you want a great example of ingratitude. Luke 17, the healing of the ten lepers. Right. What an example there. Ten lepers came, all, all full of leprosy. And the Lord sent them all away. Go show yourselves to the priest. All ten of them. Show me another example in the New Testament where Jesus healed ten at one time. There's many times where he would heal. The Bible said he would heal them all, but we did he heal them one at a time? There's some passages, Matthew 8, Matthew 9, where he had laid hands on a whole group, but ten people all at once healed. Right. Ten people were happy. Right. Ten people were very happy. Yeah, we one person came back to give thanks to God. Right. One person came back. That's, that's one out of ten. Is that any indication of, of what a population would be? In fact, the Lord himself said, wait, didn't I heal ten? Didn't I heal ten? Is there no one who came back to give glory to God except for this one who is a foreigner? Only one, one out of ten? Where are the nine, he said. Where are the nine? Would that indicate, you think, that we've got 90% ingratitude in the general population? 90% ingratitude? I mean, is that an indicative number? It sure is true here. Luke 17, 90% ingratitude. Let's not be among the ungrateful. I know 100% of those lepers... Well, happy. Yeah, that's right. Amen. But one came back, one came back to give glory to God. Wow. You got to think about passages like that sometimes. 100% were happy, 100% were blessed, 10% came to give God glory. <laughs> Ninety percent were happy, though. The other ninety percent were happy, they, but they were just—they were going to be busy now. I'm yeah. busy. Oh, I got a lot of things to do. I got—I got—I got to make up for a lot of lost time. Wow. Well, I want to just conclude today, just reminding us that yeah. our hearts should be full to overflowing with gratitude to God at all times, at all times, and in all of our circumstances. Yeah. Even in all of our circumstances, Psalms 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall occasionally be, uh, no, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise will continually be in my mouth, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how I'm feeling, I will bless the Lord at all times. That's what I will do. I will be grateful. I will not be an, an ingrate. Amen. 
You've got the great psalms of praise and gratitude, actually most of the psalms, but Psalms 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, serve the Lord with groaning and moaning and, and grumbling and mumbling. And No, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with complaining. No, with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Into, into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Hallelujah. Let us be thankful. Amen. Amen. Father, we do pray. We thank you, Lord, for all of your mercies upon us, mercies we do not deserve, mercies we do not merit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that that you chose to die for us on a rugged tree, that you shed your blood and exchanged your death for the death we deserved, your life for the life that we now have in Christ. Lord, deliver us from ingratitude. Lord, don't let this ungratefulness creep into our lives or our minds or our thoughts. Don't let us fall into the snare of complaining and, and grumbling and feeling sorry for ourselves. But instead, Lord, remind us that we ought to be a people of praise, a people of worship, a people who are truly, genuinely thankful. Lord, we know that you call upon us to give thanks in everything. In everything, give thanks. We thank you, Lord. We even heard a word to that effect this morning. In everything, give thanks. Let us be thankful in all of our situations, in all of our circumstances, and throughout all of our lives. We pray it. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. A thankful heart is a joyful heart. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.